All right, good day to you. I'm Brother James. I greet you once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And we come to the 15th chapter. This is a very, very short chapter containing only eight verses. And let me say some things introductory to the chapter before we uh, jump into the verse-by-verse -verse material. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels furnish us with an excellent example of how the Word of God reveals truth. Matthew sets forth Christ as Israel's Messiah and King. Mark presents Him as the servant of the Lord. Luke emphasizes the Son of Man, Christ in His humanity. And then John, Jesus as the Son of God, or God manifest in the flesh, showing forth His deity. Each book covers the same time period, but each book brings out certain peculiar phases of the Lord's life on earth. So they, they sit one on top of the other and, and give us a more complete picture than we would have if we just had one, uh, one of the four narratives. The book of Revelation is given in much the same way. We have seen that the sixth seal presented in a panoramic way the great day of the Lord, though several uh, years before it had taken place. Then under the seventh seal, we went back and uh, looked at various particulars leading up to that day. Again, the seventh trumpet in chapter 11, verses 15 to 18, revealed the anger of the nations, the coming of God's wrath, and the accompanying uh, tremendous matters. Yet we went back in chapters 12 and 13 to consider in vision God's plan for Israel. Then again, at the close of chapter 14, we had a vision of the Son of Man reaping the harvest of the earth and treading the wine press at Armageddon, destroying the rebel nations who had gathered to destroy Israel. But in chapters 15 and 16, we return to consider certain particulars preceding the great day of wrath and Armageddon, uh, visitations of God, uh, preliminary judgments, uh, just as the ten plagues in Egypt were preliminary to the complete overthrow of Pharaoh and his host in Egypt, so there are preliminary judgments, uh, huge in and of themselves, but, but not the great and final blow that God will strike, and these are sprinkled through uh, the book of Revelation. Now keep in mind, you got to keep this in mind, or you're going to try to make the book of Revelation a mere chronological narrative, and it's not. Now, it does unfold the, the vision of Christ in chapter 1 at, at His resurrection, and then the, the churches in chapter 2 and 3, and then the catching away of that church and transport to heaven in 4 and 5. But then you have six judgments and a seventh, and then six judgments issuing out of the seven and a seventh, and then six final judgments issuing out of a seventh and a final judgment. So there is some chronological sequence, obviously, to the book of Revelation, but it's not all strictly chronological. And when we read in chapter 15, verse 1, for example, uh, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. That requires a, a chronology. It requires that the other plagues came before these. This can mean nothing other than an order of events, but there's also a returning to certain subjects, persons, and places found through the course of a narrative. Uh, let's look at another instance of this method. In, in Revelation 14, 8, we read about uh, Babylon. Uh, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. There's the announcement. But it's only in anticipation. In chapter 16, we observe Babylon being visited by the earthquake of the seventh vial. Then in chapter 17 and 18, we go back and consider what Babylon is, her history, her relation to the world powers, her relation to the Antichrist, and her, her final earthly destruction. 
So these things, uh, there's a general order throughout the book, a general timeline, if you will, but there's also some jumping ahead and jumping back, and and we got to be careful as we we consider those matters. All right, 15.1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Remember, remember we talked about that cup, that cup being all, uh, you know, a drop here and a drop there and a little bit here and a little bit there, but finally that cup is filled and the Lord pours it out. Well, here we, here we are. This great and marvelous uh, phrase tells us that the range and intensity of what follows exceeds anything rendered previously. Signs of healing accompany the preaching of the gospel. Signs of death attend the end of the tribulation time. Much of Revelation speaks of plagues, but these are signified as the last. All to this point in the book of Revelation has been but the opening artillery barrage. Now comes the full assault. These seven last plagues are called the wrath of God in chapter 16 and verse number 1, uh, the wrath of God. And I heard a great voice in the temple uh, saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So uh, 15.1 is the announcement, seven last plagues in them, the wrath of God. And then 16.1, the instruction to pour out the wrath of God. So the vials of chapters 15 and 16 contain God's wrath. Picture for us the outpouring of God's wrath against Satan and sin. Now the entirety of this tribulation period is spoken of as the wrath of God, but technically, technically speaking, It's the wrath of Satan allowed by God. Look at chapter 12, verse 12, just to uh, refresh our memories. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And it's this wrath that the Jews are told to flee during the second half of the tribulation time, Matthew 24 and verse number 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When this is ended, as if if Satan's wrath permitted was not enough, it's followed by God's wrath from the beginning with the seventh trumpet chapter 11, verses 15 to 18, and running forward to the second coming of Christ. In 15.2, we read about the sea of glass mingled with fire. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. We are going to take a, a full and lengthy session to deal with this sea of glass. It won't be, it won't be today. The sea of glass is before the throne of God at this time. At the time of Revelation 15, it is still before the throne of God. And, and I have wondered, it's, it's purely speculation. I, I don't really have any, any proof for it, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue for or against it, but I have wondered if what John is beholding, the sea of glass before the throne, was not previously mingled with fire, but now the sea of glass is mingled with fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, 
but he himself shall be saved so as by fi- yet so as by fire. So I've wondered if John is not from his vantage point on the earth observing the tribulation, looking upward to see uh, these seven angels coming forth with these seven vials and these seven last plagues. As he looks up, he saw a sea of glass mingled with fire. Perhaps he's beholding the ongoing judgment seat of Christ, which is taking place in heaven while the tribulation is, is running its course down here on earth. Just, just a thought, just a thought. The Bible says in the second verse, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Here's a great practical truth for, uh, to help my heart and to help yours. We are told in in Ephesians 6, stand therefore. We are told to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're told to put on the whole armor of God and stand and having done all to stand. The New Testament church is not told to defeat the devil. We're not told to wage war against the devil. We're not told, the New Testament church is not told to go forth and cast out devils or uh, build Christ's kingdom or any of the other things that, that you may have heard. The New Testament church is told to take the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, receive the gift of God, which is eternal life, be indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Uh, worship God, assemble together, fellowship together, build up one another in our most holy faith. What are we told to do with regard to the devil and his works in the world? Just stand. Neither give place to the devil. Now, it's interesting because in in this great tribulation time, he says they got the victory over the beast and yet they did nothing They did nothing to stop the work of the beast. They did nothing to overthrow the work of the beast. It's said that they they got victory over his image, and yet they didn't break into the temple by night and tear down that image. They didn't smash it to bits with with hammers. They didn't uh, throw a rope around it and pull it down, but the Bible says they got victory over that image and, and over his mark and over the number of his name. And yet, right up until the time that God overthrows that beast, God does it, not any group of saints during the tribulation. Right up to the very time God overthrows that beast, he is still marking and branding men with that image. So, do you see These are said to have gotten victory over the beast because they did not allow the beast to get victory over them. They are said to have gotten victory over his image simply because they never bowed down to that image. They are said to have gotten victory over his mark and over his number not because they waged war against it, but because they refused to receive it. They didn't participate. And so, brother, sister, victory over Satan doesn't require that I overthrow him. It just requires that I not give in to him. Victory over the devil Victory over the world, victory over the flesh doesn't mean I eradicate my flesh. Victory over the world doesn't mean that I change the world. The world will remain unchanged until Jesus comes again. My flesh will remain unchanged until I am am caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But I can have victory over the world and victory over the flesh by standing and not giving in to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And thank the Lord, he rewards us. 
not for going forth and conquering. That's not our task. It's not our assignment. But he rewards us for keeping the ground he gave us and not yielding any of it back to the devil. So these have gotten the victory over the beast. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, and this will uh, take some time, but uh, we have nothing but time. Psalm 73, I'm certain it has other applications, but I am confident that this psalm expresses the searching heart experienced by the believer living during that seven years of tribulation time. Consider as we read this psalm together, just let, let's try to put ourselves in the great tribulation. We are trying to stand. We are trying to refuse the devil's offer of the mark that would bring with it food and refreshment and a measure of safety and so forth. Let's see what we have. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. What a temptation it would be during a time of such trouble, during a day of such powerful satanic pressure to give in and take that mark, to give in and just go along with the system that's been established. Verse 3, for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We think of prosperity in terms, or, or the people I know do, in terms of modern incredibly wealthy America. But how a man with no food would envy a man who is eating. How a man struggling to survive would envy a man standing in line to get his rations. This man said, I was, I was envious. I was envious. They're wicked. I know they're wicked. Oh, I know they're wicked. But they have and I lack but they eat and I starve. Verse four, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They not only lived, but they were strong enough to put men in bondage and to kill them. They're wicked. Oh, I know they're wicked, but I sure wish I had what they had. I don't want to lose my soul, but oh, look how, how well they live compared to the way I'm forced to live. Verse five, they are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Their union with the beast afforded them some measure of escape from the full uh, consequences of the tribulation judgments. Verse 6 says, Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, and violence covereth them as a garment. Pride and violence. Pride and violence. Someone wears a chain around his neck. Look, I have wealth. Someone wears a chain around uh, her neck. Look, I, I, I'm loved. Someone bought this for me. Someone wears a chain around their neck. Look at this valuable uh, token. It, it offers me and affords me opportunities here and there. And this man says, I, I have none of that. Verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. How this would pain a starving man. Consider the blasphemous tongue of beastly arrogance in verses 8 and 9. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. They speak against God. They speak against His Word. They speak against all that is holy. 
And while those who are true to the Lord are hiding in their secret places, just barely getting by, these walk and talk openly anywhere in the earth for all the world to see because at this time, it's the devil's world. It's the devil's world. Verse number 10, Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, belly worshipers who give their soul to the beast for a piece of bread. And they say, How doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? During such a time of horror, it'll be easy. It'll be easy for those deceived into thinking that God is only love, deceived into thinking that God is only mercy, to think He's forgotten, forsaken, abandoned the earth. My friend, think about it. If you were to watch religious television, you would soon develop the idea that God is only for, he's not against. That God is only love and kisses and gifts and rewards and he is not judgment and chastisement and punishment. If you attended the average, the average church in this day and time, be it the uh, the old school liberal mainline denominations or the new school uh, beach party, rock and roll, dance club, you would certainly think that God just loves everyone and everything and, and all, all God wants to do is just make ministers rich and, and let you get in on a little of the trickle down. So, if you were living in a time of such death and destruction and horror and judgment, it would be very easy for you to think that if there is a God, he's certainly not paying attention to what's going on down here. Verse number 12, Behold, these are the ungodly. These are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. How could you think otherwise? under such conditions. Again in verse 13, the temptation to take the mark. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. I, I, I did what God told me to do. I allowed him to create him a clean heart. I, I allowed him to wash me and, and, and make me clean, but maybe uh, it just seems sometimes like it, it didn't amount to anything. It, it didn't profit me. And watch the tempter whisper in verse 14. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Hear that devil? You trusted God and got nothing but hunger and trouble. Forsake him. Forsake him. Come over to my side. See why we have to stand? You see why they're rewarded for standing and getting victory? Verse 14 says, or 15, if I say, I will speak thus. Behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Even in such a day, fellowship helps strengthen those who are wavering. The generation is a reference to the tribulation saints. Remember Matthew 24, 34, this generation shall not pass. Verse 16 says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Now look, look at the verse carefully. Look at it carefully. Without a new birth, without the indwelling Holy Spirit, man cannot really know God. But that which has carried the Hebrews through many a holocaust surfaces again. He cannot bear the thought of offending his brethren. I don't want to sell out my people. 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You know, the thing that gets you through, the trouble, the doubt, 
the heartache, the discouragement of looking around at wicked people doing wicked things and faring, quite honestly, better than you. I'm not saying we should ever speak against God, but the Christian afflicted with cancer, the Christian whose child has been taken in death, the, the Christian whose spouse has been unfaithful looks at those in the world who it seems everything is going their way. And it can really shake you. It can really erode your confidence and faith in the Lord. But he said, until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. I went to the place where the Lord was praised in song. I went to the place where the Lord was trusted in prayer. I went to the place where the Lord was exalted in the preaching of the word. I went to the pray, place where other believers were there to prop me up and strengthen me. And then understood I their end. Their beginning may be better than mine. Their middle may be better than mine, but their end, oh, oh, I want nothing to do with their end. Verse 18, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down unto destruction. Slippery places. When I was uh, much younger, uh, physically in much better condition, had a lot more confidence in my physical abilities than I had sense between my ears. My wife and I, with our children, we had several books. One was um, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee. And we purposed to hike to, if we could, to hike to all of the waterfalls in that southeastern part of the United States, and then just because it seemed like a, a good thing to do, uh, I tried to get in and beneath each of those waterfalls. Let me tell you something. Some of those, some of those big falls, that water coming down, it, it will pound you. It will, it will, it'll, it'll hurt you. I, I wouldn't, I'm not recommending anyone do this. Um, she didn't like it when I took my son out for some of them. Anyway, I have seen people fall, and you have too. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I've seen people fall. They're, they're trying, trying. You get on those slick sandstone rocks with that water running over them day after day after day and just a little tiny bit of algae, most of it not thick enough to be seen growing on the top of that rock. You don't do one of these. You hit that rock and you're, you're down. You, know what that is? you slipped. Slipping is, is oftentimes instantaneous where a fall could, at, at least you got time to know you're falling. I've seen people slip on those rocks and just, oh, hit their head so, so hard. It, it's terrible, terrible. Uh, you say, well, did that make you stop? No, no, but I uh, just, Tell you, down you go quick. Here's what he said. The Lord has not marked these wicked people to gradually realize they've lost their footing and try their best to stabilize themselves and have time to throw their arms out and catch themselves. Many of the things that are uh, involved in a fall no, he's put them in slippery places. They will be up and in the blink of an eye, crashing down. He said, I, don't, I, I considered their end and I realized God had marked them for sudden destruction. Verse 19, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? See that? Remember that cup? It's not a little, a little, a little, a little, a little. It's prosperity, riches, Power, one moment later, desolation. That's how God does it. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream, when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. It's like this seven years of tribulation 
has been a bad nightmare. And you know this, this reference here to, um, to waking up out of a dream? It's frequently used in the Bible as a reference to the turning of the Jewish captivity at the close of the tribulation. And, and what got these people in, in such trouble? Their image. Their image. God. God despises their image. Verse 21. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. There's repentance. Not not of the deed. He didn't commit the deed. He's repenting of being tempted to do the deed, to take the mark, to bow to the image. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Interesting. Those who trust in the Lord are made like him. Likewise, those who take the mark will be like the beast. Now, a beast can be made to do any task if food is held before its nose. This man almost traded his soul for a morsel of meat. He said, I was, I was almost like a beast before thee. See, the man who looks at the temporal will live for the temporal. But the man who sees himself as under the eye of God will make different choices and good ones. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. God upholds. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. There's his hope. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire beside thee, no trust in the beast, but in the God of heaven and earth. My flesh and my heart faileth. I, I, I may starve to death. I may die of fright. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He knows, he knows. I might not make it through this time of trouble alive, but I'll live forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee, but God is good for me to draw. It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare thy works. And this resolve, this resolve, may cost this man his head, but he is resolved. He'll not join the beast. He'll stay true to God. So, and so this is why the Bible says in Revelation 15, 2, they stood, they stood. And because they stood, they got the victory. And what a change. Looked at from man's side, looked at from man's side, we read that the beast made war against them and overcame them. But looked at from God's side, they have gotten the victory over the beast. On earth, the cry is, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's what we read. In heaven, the song is, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? God is always victorious in the end, and so are those who trust him. These saints who died rather than worship the beast and his image are now singing praises in the presence of God, while those who worship the beast, we read, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. I don't know what you're suffering today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how difficult your lot in life has been. But I know it gets worse when you look around and see wicked, ungodly people who don't know the Lord, in fact, who seem to be very much His enemies doing well. 
And I know how discouraging it gets. And I know Satan can tempt you to join him. He'll say, I, I treat my people better than God treats his people. Get in that sanctuary. Get your eyes back on the Lord. Consider their end. Consider our end. Trust in God. Trouble now, joy forever. What does Satan offer? A little good time now, but suffering and torment forever. I'll stick with the Lord. I'll stick with the Lord. God helping me. You stick with the Lord. God helping you. All right, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us. It helps you. Subscribe right there, that little button on the YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Till next time, I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you and good day.